Chapter 16 If there is one thing that can be said in favour of council buildings, it is that they inevitably possess a wealth of corridors which seem to have been expressly designed so that the distraught and despairing might pace back and forwards along them, swearing and muttering, yet secure in the knowledge that no one will ever pay them the slightest attention. Within moments of Lucas's terrible disclosure, John and Jim had found one of these aforementioned corridors that was ideal for their present needs. John did the piercing, while Jim leant upon a wall smoking a cigarette. But the more John pierced and worried, the more did Pooley become calmly philosophical about the whole thing. Presently, he said, John, we may be losing our headquarters, but we will be gaining ten million pounds. O'Malley gazed at him. The boy was clearly a fool. Jim, said he, Jim, we will not be simply losing the headquarters. We'll be gaining a prolonged period of incarceration at the pleasure of Her Majesty the Queen. God bless her. Jim raised his glass. You what? Present, Jim. When the local guard get aboard that barge, as they are certain to do so once a side foreman or some such gets a look inside, then we are marked men. It may just be a video recorder here and a bit of puffing there to us, but to the boys in blue, it'll be a chance to clean up every outstanding case they've got in their books. We shall deny all of course, said Jim defiantly. Jim, the barge is full of stolen property. It is covered in our fingerprints, personal possessions, articles of clothing. Why, you even got your holiday snaps up on that salon wall. I thought they made the place look more homely. We'll get five years at the very least. Jim's hands began to quiver. At times of great stress, it had always been his habit to flap his hands wildly and spin about in small circles. Exactly where this had its genesis is hard to say, although no doubt Neville might have offered a suggestion or two. Uh, hang on, said Jim in mid-flap. We could always do a runner. Do a runner? Certainly. Off to Rio de Janeiro. We could get Bob to post our winnings when the games start. And perhaps he'd advance us the airfare if we ask him nicely. O'Malley's voice had what they call an edge to it. Do you think so? No, Jim, I do not think so. Nor do I think that doing a runner would be of the slightest use. Unless you happen to have the necessary fake passport, know the underworld safe houses, and hold sway with bribable officials. And as to the matter of Bob banging ten million pounds in an airmail envelope and posting it on Jim, you're a double buffoon. Pooley flapped his hands wildly and spun about in small circles. Oh, he's lost, he wailed. Oh, doom and gloom, get a grip of yourself, man. The bowling chains, moaned Pooley. The manacles, that tent of blue, the prisoner kills the sky. Very poetic, Jim. Now do hush, will you? Oh, go stir crazy. A Pooley in the pokey, the shame, the terrible shame. Pooley! Cease this foolishness or I will give you a smack. We'll have to clear it all out, said Jim. All the evidence, get it away. Round into your house, for instance. Oh, no, said John. Not my house, absolutely not. Then think of something else, then. I am trying. Slammed in the slammer, mumbled Jim. Chucked in the chokey, banged up in the nick. That's it, said O'Malley, plunging his right fist into his left palm. What, give ourselves up? No, banged up. That's it, Jim. Bang, up. Strangely, said Jim, I failed to understand. Bang, said O'Malley. As in bombs go bang. We shall blow up the barge. Blow up the barge. Jim took in this intelligence and mulled it over in his mind. Be saying you, said Jim Pooley in a matter not altogether unknown to the prisoner of the now legendary television series. The unmarked coach bearing the well-breached, well-fed and well-and-truly outfit workers of Whitehall on the next leg of the Brentford day trip left discreetly from the rear car park at two o'clock as the front doors of the town hall opened to admit the hoi polloi. The crowd flooded the exhibition hall with murmurs of dissension and disapproval, turning slowly to gasps of wonder and disbelief at the miracles upon display. For miracles are fearsome, and fear provokes a grudging respect. It was therefore a somewhat hushed and attentive audience that watched and listened as membrane and mucus went through yet another polished presentation. But this one differed, containing many subtle nuances designed to provoke thought alone. Adolf Hitler 
of evil memory, believed that a crowd was only capable of grasping a single idea at any one time, and this had to be drummed into it again and again. Here membrane and mucus amalgamated two simple concepts, honour for the borough and prosperity for its citizens, into a winning combination. This simple device afforded the avaricious an opportunity to disguise their deadly sin beneath a display of fealty to their town. Great emphasis was placed upon the safety aspects of gravitite and the temporary nature of the stadium. But the final line of Membrane's speech sold it completely. Of course, said he, every Brentonian will receive a free pass valid for the entire games. An ever so tiny silence preceded the tumultuous applause that even the audio-soluble polysilicate floor tiles were hard-pressed to swallow. Choruses of For Whoever He Is Is A Jolly Good Fellow were chorused and hats cast and willy-nilly towards the newly painted ceiling. Messrs Membrane and Mucus wrung each other's hands and flashed expensive smiles. Their minders grinned lopsidedly and feigned comprehension. As the crowds conga lined away to celebrate their good fortune in the nearby taverns and spread the word to those who might have missed it, the great hall returned once more to stillness and silence. The VDUs hummed softly, and the giant images upon the wall video continued their endless roar. No one noticed the elderly gentleman whose slim, frail hands rested upon the ivory handle of his black malacca cane as he peered down at the model town and its glittering star-shaped companion. His ice-blue eyes glowed with a fierce vitality beneath their snow-lashed lids, and his mane of pure white hair flowed over the astrakhan collar of the long black coat he wore, despite the clemency of the season. The tip of his cane traced the outlines of the stadium before tapping out a brisk yet muffled tattoo upon the tiled floor. Shaking his head, Professor Slocum turned upon his heel and strode from the hall.